Hi everybody, I'm from Alessandro uh, from Performance Lab um, and welcome everybody to the third episode of uh, Performance Quest with Francesco Puzzolin, my co-host and with the guest of today, Kyle Meadows, which I'm really happy to present. Um, well, uh, Kyle should no need of presentation, but um, it's a coach with a great experience with NFL, NBA athletes, um, and is an expert of speed development program. And he has worked and is currently working with uh, Olympic athletes and elite around the world. So uh, he's also uh, a consultant of uh, technology. I really hope I've not forget uh, anything, Kyle. Uh, okay. and sorry if. Well, uh, Francesco, do you want to add something you you just said, right? Yeah, I'm really, you know, I'm really excited to have Kyle with us uh, today. Uh, I know him from uh, from long, from uh, more than 10 years. And uh, I would like to start telling a story, you know, the, how I met Kyle the first time, because it could be an example, in my opinion, for many, many coaches. I was the head strength conditioning for the Toronto Raptors at the time. And Kyle was the, the, the personal trainer for, uh, for one of the I mean, best uh, NBA player at the time, that was Chris Bosch, was our franchise player. And I went to Dallas to, to visit Kyle. We didn't know before. We were just uh, sharing a few ideas. I saw uh, Chris uh, um, practicing with Kyle. And, and uh, I mean, we, we, we leave each other, you know, uh, saying, OK, let's keep in touch because, uh, you know, your knowledge is very important for me. You know the player better than me. And uh, I, I'm going to follow the athlete during the season. I think if we are on the same page, it would be great for, for, for the guy, you know. And uh, Chris had a very, very uh, important season that time. We didn't get the playoff for, for, for nothing, for a game. But he was able to sign, you know, a very important uh, contract. He went to Miami. He won. Uh, he won the NBA title. Just to explain, in my opinion, that is very important when you meet people with which you can share your experience. You know, you learn something. You take something with good people. With people with the with the knowledge, they are not undermining you. I mean, th th there's no jealousy. Top coaches around the world that I met, and Kyle is one of, of them, you know, have no secrets. There are no secrets in our job. There are no, uh, let's say, magic formulas that you can apply. So having the chance or meeting high-level professional, it's like a, finding a, a nugget, you know. This is why, you know, I was so happy on finding a coach uh, working with my players and having a, with my player at the time and having the chance to share knowledge and, and, and problems with him. Now, you know, currently I, I hear coaches that are, you know, uh, um, watching each other in a wrong way. Uh, they think that they have some secrets that they want to keep uh, on, on their pockets. Guys, training, our job is more... Uh, is most of the time done with passion and done sharing knowledge with the others. In any case, after you are the guy that got to take decisions, you know, to solve problems on day by day. So nothing is changing. So just, just to give a message, you know, from our experience, we know from long we had chances to work together in some projects and we, you know, and we love sharing knowledge uh, together. So this is the message, you know, this is why I want to tell this story about Kyle, because it, it's, it can be an example for many coaches that start this, uh, this kind of business and still, you know, have no idea how uh, to, behavior, uh, to behave in, in a proper way. So this is, uh, you know, the way I want to present Kyle. Uh, the topic of today is very a uh, nice topic. We want to speak about acceleration. I think acceleration is important for many sports. Uh, in, there are so many applications we can talk about. But the first question is, you know, uh, I have, you know, I, I have spoken with many coaches, above all in team sports, and they still believe that the athletes are bored fast. You know, that uh, uh, we cannot make so many changes, you know, to improve their ability to accelerate. So, which is your opinion, opinion, Kyle? 
It's a great question. Um, it's a great question, Kutso. And um, in, in, in acceleration, it really is the most important aspect of human performance. And what is human performance? You know, we talked about all those start and stop sports, soccer, football, basketball, all those things where if we stop, we have to accelerate. So it's, it's the one point where you can make the biggest difference. And how to make that difference is understanding what are the most important things about acceleration. Especially, so we'll, we always like to start from four locomotion, from a three-point start or from someone out of the blocks. Initiation of motion and the next three steps. An average football play is 2.8 seconds. Those are three, four steps. That is the most important part. And that's the part where you can affect the change. So if you understand the start angle, if you understand force, the application of force in the correct angle applies horizontal force. That is acceleration. When you put your body in the right angle to move forward, that is acceleration. So the more force I have, strength, the lower angle I have. The lower angle I have, the more horizontal acceleration as opposed to vertical acceleration, so you're moving in the right direction. And it really comes down to those factors. A subset of those factors are several things that all can be measured. So we measure the angle of the, the starting position. We, we measure flight time from the back foot to how far we take off. That distance that we travel will give us an indication of force applied. We look at the back leg extension. Does that leg fully extend? Which shows us that we've got all the power through our hips. There was nothing left in the tank because that back leg, if it doesn't extend, it acts as a clutch and it absorbs the energy. So we look at that. All things can be measured with, 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 with video. And then we look at the knee drive and most importantly, the front foot, the front leg, negative acceleration. What's the angle of that front leg as it comes back? Does it actually push back and help us move horizontally? Or does it come straight under the body, which means that the athlete didn't have enough strength to support that angle, and it acts as a braking mechanism? It acts, it goes straight into the ground as opposed to pushing back. These are some of the things that all can be measured that are key factors in acceleration. So you're giving us so many details, you know, that are so, so specific. So you are agreed that acceleration is a skill. It's something that you learn. It's not something that you was born. Absolutely. It is something that you learn. It is something that you learn. And just to go on that fact, you know, when I get my NFL athletes, so I have when I prepare them for the NFL combine, I usually have them for eight weeks. They're coming. There's only so much difference that I'm going to make in an eight week period of time, but I'm going to develop their skill of initiation of motion in the first three steps. I'm going to develop that skill. And as that skill develops, their time changes exponentially. Absolutely a skill, and it's a very good word to, to, so, to, to put acceleration with the learned skill. Absolutely. So you, you say that acceleration can be developed also with the senior athletes at any age, in any, in any moment of their career? Absolutely. It's knowledge. It's knowledge base. It's teaching. It's, it's neuromuscular re-education, and it's a knowledge base. Absolutely can be developed. So let me ask you something uh, about basketball because, <laughs> you know, it's my field. And when, uh, when I work with the tall guys, you know, that they got these kind of uh, sizes, you know, it is probably one of uh, the, detail, the details that I, that, that, uh, I take care about, you know, because the, nobody taught them, uh, you know, how to accelerate, how to use the body, how to prepare the body, you know. We are always speaking to stay, you know, in a triple flexion position or in a staggered position, but really they don't know how to initiate the motion. Right. So uh, 
do you think that uh, in many team sports we underestimate, uh, let's say, the value to how to teach acceleration to players because we, we think they can do it naturally, but still, like like you say, at any age in any sports, you can bring a bunch of details that can change completely the efficiency and the efficacy of to accelerate. So, so as you know, Kuto, we've had many conversations about the inadequacies of some levels of training, right? Mm -hmm. And the knowledge that it takes to affect the neuromuscular change in athletes and to understand that when you have tall athletes, we're talking about the center of mass and lowering the center of mass exactly. and creating those starting angles so you can actually accelerate, right? And it's one thing to ask an athlete to, to play in a low center of mass or to drop his hips, but unless you develop that eccentric strength in the quads so they can be comfortable down there, you have no starting ability. And when you have no starting ability for acceleration or for reaction, you have nothing, you have no base. So you, you can't affect the change unless you prepare that athlete to be, to have also starting position. Okay, so. absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'm really agree on it. And, uh, uh, you know, you, you did work also with a lot of uh, young athletes. So what about uh, in your experience, uh, which is the best period to improve this ability in a long term development program? So in a youth program, for example. Yeah, that's a really good question, Kuto. And a lot of people don't understand the windows of opportunity for neuromuscular development, especially fast twitch fiber development in young athletes. And it's that range is a little different for boys and girls, but that range from like 10 to 14 years of age is really, I love to get young athletes. You know, I do a lot of work with prepubescent athletes and it's great to get these young athletes and start developing their systems. You're, you're, you're developing movement patterns is what you're doing. And mm -hmm. to develop those early on has a lasting effect throughout. So to be specific, that age group between 10 and 14 of young athletes is prime window of opportunity to affect that neuromuscular development. So you say, that, okay, I'm absolutely, absolutely agree. And uh, uh, above all, once again, if you're working in some sports where sizes are, are not normal, let's say, you know, people that are taller than others or, or, or I don't know, uh, let's say I'm, I'm thinking about the NFL guys, you know, or rugby players, you know, they are big sizes, you know. Uh, teaching them how how to accelerate, how to use the body, technically speaking, is very very important because it's something that they can bring on the field, on the floor, any time that they are practicing. So having this uh, kind of a uh, of a focus, you know, uh, on on uh, on the young athletes, I think it's it's a great starting point. And uh, about horizontal power, you know, you mentioned before, you know, this ability uh, to create power, you know, when you accelerate. Uh, in your experience, uh, if I, let's say, uh, try to develop horizontal power with my athletes uh, in, a, in a linear way, is there any advantage also if they are moving in a multi-directional multi way? Are these kind of aspects connected in your experience? Absolutely they're connected because what do we do as coaches, Kuto? We're trying to develop an athlete and give them a bigger engine give them more ability regardless of where they go up sideways side to side it doesn't matter we're creating a system that fires more rapidly we're creating musculars that have greater contractile properties so it doesn't matter which way they go they're going to have more fuel they're going to have more ability to move quickly in that way all right so what but and of course we take that initial information and then we can mimic the specific motion that they do in those multi-directional sports. But overall, we're enhancing their athletic ability overall, which will aid them in um, success in whatever direction they're going. Now, because this is another big concern when I'm talking with other coaches that they say, uh, you know, they can, they can say that uh, uh, my athletes are not running, uh, uh, you know, 
uh, dash most of the time. They are, you know, they are running in 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 different directions. So we have to work just in that way. So I, I'm I'm not agree. You you're 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 learning how to use the, your body, and after you can apply the that kind of pattern in different different directions. But in any case, the starting point is always linear. And and Kuto, I must add that uh, uh, the best way to to answer those questions with those coaches that may not understand it is baseline information. When we have baseline data of a particular skill or exercise and we have a stopwatch and we, this is our initial number, we can show the difference as we train and as the athlete gets better. We can take some of the subjectivity out of the process and when the athlete can see the change and when the coaches can see the change, then we don't have to guess. Then science becomes science and we don't have to make these you know, it doesn't have to be subjective anymore. So baseline data is always advantageous to the starting process. So we know exactly where we are and we can chart our growth. And mm -hmm. as coaches, when we chart the growth, good coaches will say, oh, I need to tweak something here because it's not changing as I thought, or mm -hmm. this is really effective. All right. So baseline yeah. data is a key. Yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, having some objectives, uh, evaluation is is the starting point for any training uh, uh, process. So that's uh, absolutely important. Let's say to provide a few uh, of of your training tips. So, which are the 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 pillars of your uh, training system? You want to share with the uh, young uh, young generation of coaches? You know, which are your your main pillars for your training, uh, um, let's say, uh, approach. Uh, yeah. Starting from the bottom, which is the, st the first step that usually you are taking with your athletes when, when you want to improve their acceleration. What are you proper, looking for? Proper analysis. Proper analysis, and it starts with biomechanical analysis. I'm looking at angles. So when I get an athlete in the first time, I watch them run or I watch them do that task and I videotape it and we go frame by frame and I'm educating the athlete on human performance. I'm educating the athlete on biomechanics. I'm showing them how they do it. I'm showing them a proper way and I'm teaching that system and everything starts with biomechanics, whether you're a forward locomotion athlete where you're where side to side, it doesn't matter. It all starts with the mechanics and teaching that athlete how the body moves and how the body moves optimally. And every coach can show you good form. They can show you bad form, but can they explain the reasons why there's bad form? So what makes us unique, Kuto, is the education process that we take our athletes through and understanding what they need to accomplish in order to make a physiological and athletic change. That's what makes us special, the knowledge and the base that we give our athletes of information to make that change. And as we discussed before, the biomechanics is so imperative to making that change. Just to say to our listeners, if they check your Instagram profile, they can see some very interesting posts where you are showing, uh, you know, in a very simple way, you know, with a, with a great technology, just with a camera, with a phone, some of uh, uh, very interesting uh, uh, details that, that you are providing to your to your athletes. So the first step, let's say, uh, you know, it's body awareness. You know, you, you start uh, teaching athletes how to be aware of their body and you know how to learn to move properly so the second step after this approach what could be well this the second step is really the adaptation neuromuscular development one of the missing pieces when we talked about what the coaches are missing when in basketball players and they all think that the athletes just come fast this is one of the most important parts that we teach is speed development in the weight room. It's really mimicking the motions that we use, that we want to move fast, the development of speed in the weight room. It's not done with weights, it's, it's a weight room, but it's not, it's, we have a stopwatch and we have a, a measuring mechanism and we yeah. take the athletes through all these measured 
exercises and they um, they line up with performance. As the time gets faster with these exercises, the performance gets faster. That is one of the biggest parts of what we do and what we do well and very few people do. <laughs> no, this is very important. Now, you know, I, I went straight to the to the point, you know, because uh, I'm agree that if you want to move uh, um, fast, you got to train fast. There are no other right. rules, you know. But in my opinion, there are too many coaches that uh, start with the strength training. You know, uh, considering strength a key factor, it is a key factor, but has to be applied in a proper way and at the proper moment. That's right. You anticipate the strength uh, training or the strength improvement, you know, before the two pillars that you've just mentioned. So the biomechanics of movement, so being aware of how my body is moving. Uh, try to emphasize speed over strength. Okay, above all, heavy strength. And we know, all of us, we know that heavy strength means a slow movement. That's right. Because you cannot move uh, weights in a fast way if they are too heavy. That's right. And, and heavy, heavy weights means also low quality of coordination because you cannot move. That's right. So try to find a compromise between, between these two factors. So speed and strength is fundamental. If I have to pick one, the first one, and I'm agree with you, and I know your, your philosophy, I know the way you are approaching, speed is the first one. Yes. What do you think about? Absolutely. As we, we're in this society, especially in the football mentality, it's all about the weight, heavyweight, 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 especially on, on young kids. And that, that, that does not help us with any movement patterns. It is, as you said, Moving weight slowly. Moving weight slowly has nothing to do with any type of ballistic motion in change of direction sports. It has completely the opposite. And then it's, it's you're susceptible to injury and all kinds of un, things, you know, uh, load on the joints. No but, but the teaching of the uh, with, with speed development is always is always paramount. It comes into power. You know, it's the combination of speed and strength, you know, so we need to be able to move weight quickly, but only after the body can absorb that or accept that, not before it can absorb it and accept that weight. Does that make you know, understand? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, I know that you are a big expert about uh, uh, plyos, about plyometric training. Uh, when do you consider plyometric important with athletes, which is the key moment that you start using it. Yes. And I'm glad you mentioned plyometrics, Kuto, because you know I'm sensitive about plyometrics. Plyometrics can be a very, very valuable tool. But plyometrics will help fewer athletes than it will ever help because of the misuse of plyometrics. We have to... So the the age of plyometrics, we don't say an age, it's really the skill level. And any time we start with plyos, first of all, people need to understand what is plyometrics, right? It's the reversibility of efforts. Mm -hmm. It's the reversibility of efforts. So if I jump off a box, I'm trying to mitigate ground contact time and get back as fast as possible, right? Mm -hmm. Well, the load on the knee joint, the patellofemoral head is really immense if we don't have eccentric strength in our quads to mm -hmm. act as a shock absorption system to, to protect us from the trauma of landing. The trauma of landing is very great. So that must be developed in our young athlete. So when is the time for plyos? A time for plyos is after we've developed our athlete eccentrically in the quad so they can handle the load. Because as coaches, what is our number one job? To mitigate risk and injury. And plyos are very high level and they're very stressful on the body. So before we start the plyos, we start a system to protect the athlete from the trauma from plyos. And then it can have a positive effect. So plyometric exercises could be dangerous if they are uh, misused 
of or, or you know or just uh, uh, use it in in the wrong moment you know of when the athlete is not ready to absorb that kind of stress That's but right. if you use the plyometrics in a proper way with a proper um, uh, let's say uh, graduality they can prevent some injuries you know because you in, you are stressing the body you are increasing the centric force and you are adapting you know your body at that kind of specific stress so it's not that the exercise itself that is creating the damage is when you use the exercise at the wrong moment in the wrong way that's that's true and i'm glad you made that clear and it would almost sound like i'm negative on plyos and i'm absolutely not i actually love plyos I'm very sensitive because 95% of the use of plows are used in the wrong way. But mm -hmm. we use plows. Plows are a large part of what I do to move the needle to increase athleticism and explosion with my athletes. Absolutely. Absolutely. They need to be in that program for neuromuscular development. So you start mentioning, uh, uh, you know, injuries prevention. I don't like this definition of injury prevention. Uh, I I mostly use uh, injuries uh, reduction or uh, uh, injuries protection, but not prevention. It looks that uh, you are like in having a crystal ball. You can <laughs> you can uh, imagine which kind of injuries can uh, affect your athletes. But in any case, in, in team sports, and now Alessandro can help us because as Alessandro is a great expert about uh, indoor soccer and football. Uh, in a, in a, some team sports, um, they have so many injuries about uh, the, the posterior kinetic chain, about hamstrings, and they are you know, uh, trying to find uh, some solutions in terms of having a proper exercise, having a proper protocol, in your experience, you know, you have trained so many sprinters, you know, that are so powerful, that can accelerate, you know, at the, at the, at the, the best level. Which is the main advice you want to provide to, prov to prevent these kind of problems with the team sport athletes mainly? Yeah, so it's a mentality, right? We're a quad-dominated society. <laughs> we do back squats, we do front squats, we do side squats, we do lunges, we do everything. It's not very glamorous to train your hamstrings. And what are your options? You know, a prone hamstring curl or in order, there's not a, a, a lot of options. So we need to change this mentality. And I wish there was more of a measurement system because I predicted this year in the NFL with COVID and these athletes staying at home, and then all of a sudden arriving on the, um, on the, at the facility and the bullets are going to fly day one, right? The coaches don't have time to get these guys ready. So they're going to go from almost sitting on the couch or training on their own to going full bore. So we have now the combination of hamstrings not prepared strength-wise, and then there's been no intensity of training. And no intensity of training means you talk to some athletes, especially in track and field, they call themselves training, but then the, after they go and have their first race, they can't walk the next day. They're so sore. They're so sore. Why are you so sore? Because they never arrive at the intensity in training that they have in the meet, in the competition. So not only is it our job to strengthen those hamstrings and create a better ratio than 80, 20, or 70. Exactly. We need a 60, 40 quad to hamstring ratio. We need to prepare that athlete at the intensity level that they're going to see in competition because you can't affect the neuromuscular change at 95%. It has to be 100%. And that takes, that's a nuance. That takes some skill to prepare your athletes at that level of intensity. <laughs> no, I, I, I'm sick of it, you know, because uh, sports science, for example, is providing so many numbers about, uh, I don't know, uh, agonist, antagonist, uh, perfect ratio, uh, about, uh, you know, they are considering most of the time, you know, uh, muscle like, uh, like, uh, um, uh, like uh, one entity, you know, we are not, moving for one muscle we're moving like chain you know 
And like you say, most of the time is not question of uh, of uh, of uh, exercise. It's question that you are not uh, adapting yourself to a, a load that is specific to competition. That's it's right. the same for for football, for sorry, for soccer, for example, because uh, in my opinion, when they start playing so many games, they are not practicing anymore. So the only practice, real practice, is the game, and they stop working on themselves. This is why physical preparation, not in terms of quantity, but in quality of execution and quality of load, can be you know a great support. And it, Kutso, you make such a valid point; it almost gives me goosebumps because. <laughs> Let me tell you something. When the guys go off and they start playing, just like you said, they stop training. They stop working out. And a lot of what I do for my NFL guys now, I create training during the season. Training during the season is different than training off season. But the intensity, short duration, intense bouts keeps them at game speed. I have four guys that played yesterday. One guy had... Darren Waller had an incredible game, 200 yards, um, 13 catches, played for the Raiders. Mm -hmm. I gave him his post-workout today, and Mohamed Sanu, post-workout today, to keep them sharp, to keep their neuromuscular system very, very, very sharp in all those areas that are going to break down, the hamstrings, the shoulders, all those things that are susceptible to break down in, in, in NFL football. Mm -hmm. So what you said it needs to be shouted from the Raptors that there needs to be a better development program in season, in season that keeps them sharp, neuromuscular system sharp, and very specific to what's going to break them down during the season. So it's, it's you need to say it again. Really important. In no, no. You know, I, 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 I'm really, you know... Um, I'm really focused on this because, uh, you, you know, also in the NBA, you know, there is one thing that you never stop is the strength training. But it's not, it cannot be a journalist, you say, it has to be in-season uh, training, you know, uh, help my uh, muscles to fire in a proper way, uh, to keep balance between muscles that are overloaded and muscles that are not overloaded. So you can work on stability, you can work on, on many details to, to keep your players uh, ready for the game. But right. If you stop, you know it. It can took a, a, It can takes one month, two months, whatever. In a certain moment of the season, when you start playing three, four games a, a, a week, is very, very difficult to be right. healthy, you know, for the whole season. So yeah. it's question of details, a question of quality over quantity for sure. But it's also a question of picking up the proper protocols, the proper exercises. For, for that specific players, because they are all different. That's right. On level, they are all different. So you cannot have one program that fits all. You got to know which is your athlete body, where is strong, when, where is weak, and try, you know, to create that perfect routine that can support is a, is a playing time. That's right. And That's we're, right. you know, I laugh because we're on the same page, Kutso. But yes, you know, we go to these these high-level facilities, especially as it relates to NFL combine training and NBA combine training, we've been to them all. We won't say any names, but we know what they look like, and they've got 50 guys in there, and they all put them through the same program. You cannot expect any type of an outcome when you put all these guys through the same program. There's no cookie-cutter approach to human performance. Yeah. Everyone has to be trained based on their own anatomical structure and physical limitations. <laughs> yeah, the same the same in NBA. You know, they put some exercise on the backboard, three, four, six, three, three, four, eight, three, four, five, the kind of circuit. But in my opinion, it can it cannot I mean it's not worth you know you know it's it's not helpful. It's just a physical exercise, it's general physical exercise is not a dedicated program for a professional. So, Alessandro, have you any question for Kai so we can use his time, his experience for for, for, our, yeah. for our podcast? Yeah, yeah, of course. I, I, would, I would like to go back to, um, to the first questions about acceleration development, you know, and it's something that I, I think, Francesco, you can, you can agree with me. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sort of discussion that we have uh, specific in the 
that work in team sports. About acceleration development, you talk about a lot of details that, um, for example, the position, the starting position, the angles and all that things that it, it's right. It's right, but the discussion in, in, in Europe uh, with, with the team sports trend coaches is, uh, is around, yes, okay, but acceleration is specific and it's related to the movement of the opponent. No, you know, um, acceleration drills, acceleration movement. So what, what, it, what, what counts more is what my opponent do and how I relate my body and my movement to the opponent and and so that makes the difference so about training uh, a lot of strength coaches um don't agree with doing it analytically you know but i i i i'm it's not my point of view uh one percent uh 100 but I, i i would like to know uh what, what do you think about um acceleration analytical or just specific in a, in yeah. a sport really specific right so it, it, it depends on the sport in track and field it becomes more analytical it's more about the numbers it's more about mathematical equations right yeah in basketball when there is reaction to the opponent we train that way we use the opponent as a stimulus for our reaction so we do yeah. that one is with not without the other but that's called sport specificity. We train for that development that we need in that particular sport. So we don't have to argue with that coach that may think that there's truth in that. We know that track and field, the measurement of four and locomotion coming out of a three point stance or the blocks is very analytical, but yeah. a basketball player going off to dribble and doing a Euro step on their opponent is more reactionary But as I said before, Dakuzo, we're still developing the newer muscular system to be more effective no matter which way you go, no matter it's reactionary or it's initiation of motion. We're still creating that system. So there's no argument that we need to make the system be more effective regardless of what the athlete needs to do with it. Yeah, I'm 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 on guys same page because if I if I develop the full potential of my athlete, they can apply their potential anywhere. That's right. It's uh, not a problem. You know, in my opinion, when some coaches you know like to say they know the game, they know what's happened, or they were former athletes, you know, they start saying, yeah. I need to accelerate, but I have to read, you know, what's going on, my opponent, because they have no clue about which kind of improvement they can uh, they can do, they can push uh, their athletes doing differently. And no, no. It's, the same, it's the same for basketball, you know, when you say, look, I'm trying to teach acceleration because my players, I know they need the deceleration. But if you yeah. understand how to accelerate, I can teach you how to decelerate. And I can teach you close out. I can teach you whatever. If they don't know how to use their body to accelerate, they cannot decelerate in a proper way. And so, I will. Yeah, sorry, yeah, go, 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 go ahead. Go ahead. One of the hardest sports to convince coaches that this is, I was a strength coach for a few soccer teams. <laughs> and soccer coaches do not want to hear anything other than the skill they want to work on the skill of the game and less on the physiological um, attributes of the game necessary so i when you said this i started to smile alexandro because yeah I, yeah because I, 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 i i agree with your point of view you know <laughs> but it's yeah it's a fine i, I know <laughs> europe is a, is a, is a, is tough uh, kyle yeah, yeah. because uh, You know, you, know, you know, which is the main difference, in my opinion, my experience, you know, uh, you know, I've worked in many countries, which is the main difference between the, the Europe, men, the European mentality and the American mentality that you work on the athlete first and after on the player. Right. And we do exactly the opposite because we yeah. consider ourselves great experts in knowing the game in knowing 
tactics, knowing whatever is around in some sports, speaking about soccer, speaking about basketball or, or, or handball, you know, more, let's say, European sports. And the athletes come after. You are doing for many reasons, also for your organization in terms of uh, high school, college uh, development, you know, how you become a pro athlete is completely different uh, from, from the States to, to Europe. But for you, being athletes is just a starting point. And right. that's how you can become a good, a good player. Okay? Right. In Europe, if you are a good player, we say that is almost enough. Or we consider enough, you know, to play in Europe. We need change. We are trying to change our mentality because we have seen how many of our athletes were struggling when coming to play in, in NBA, coming yeah. to play in, in, in North America pro sports. Right. Because the gap between them and, and, and American players were very, very high. They could be good players, knowing the game, having skills, but they were not athlete enough. And you That's can make plenty of examples about that. Plenty of examples. Absolutely. Absolutely. Exactly. Yes. Okay, Alessandro, I think uh, we have uh, squeezed Kyle enough for our... <laughs> <laughs> For our podcast, no, it's always a big pleasure. Like I say, every time I'm taking something from him and uh, it's, it's uh, fabulous to see him working. And hopefully we can uh, invite him in the future from some, uh, from some clinics. Uh, I know from, uh, from uh, personal discussions that he loves Italy and he likes so much to come visit us. So I can easily say to our listener that... Uh, as this COVID situation could, could be, you know, behind our back, I would love to have Kyle in Europe, you know, for a seminar. And he can teach us, you know, a lot of his uh, uh, training tips that can be easily applied in many, many sports. And I strongly believe it. Well, thank you, Kuso. As you know, I'll come to Italy in a heartbeat. I always love working with you and... Us working together is something we're going to do for a long time, so it gives me great pleasure. So, absolutely, absolutely, amazing, amazing. We we wish we wish for that. So, uh, I close that uh, that podcast. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you, of course, Francesco. Uh, see you for the next episode. Uh, thank you for being here. Have a good night to everybody. Right. Bye from Alessandro Ciao. and the staff. Ciao. Ciao. Bye bye.